Hey everyone, and welcome to another video. NVIDIA's GeForce 310 was the successor to their infamous 210, or at least it was in name only. So in today's video, we're going to take a closer look at the 310 and see why that is, and also see how it performed on its release and in some slightly newer games. So the GeForce 310 then. It was literally the exact same as the GeForce 210. It was just a rebrand for the OEM only market. I'm not sure if it ever had a general release. It really wouldn't have made sense to do that, but I'm not sure. But yeah, they were literally the exact same card. The same GT218S GPU. In fact, the same variant, the 300-A2. Same memory, same everything. In fact, they even debuted in the exact same year of each other, only a single month apart. The 310 releasing in November 2009 compared to October of that exact same year for the 210. The 310 was however faster and accomplished this with faster GPU clock speeds, faster shader clocks and faster memory clocks. The GeForce 310 itself then was a single slot half height card which did come fitted with a full sized PCIe bracket which allows it to have a VGA connector alongside its DVI and HDMI connectors. This specific one I'm testing today though also came with the slower DDR2 memory versus the much faster DDR3. So in the stop clock test today we are going to be quite heavily memory bandwidth limited. That said, as I normally do in these videos though, I am going to be overclocking the 310 as far as possible just to try eke out a little bit more performance. I've put the clocks up that the 310 or the specific 310 managed to achieve on screen now alongside the benchmark system that I'm going to be using for today. So with all that said and done, let's first get a look at how the 310 performed in some games that were released there or thereabouts at the same time as the 310 itself. So first up is Crisis, the notoriously hard to run game which had its original release back in 2007, two years before the G4 310. Now this actually ran surprisingly well. We averaged 33.4 FPS with 21.8 and 19.4 FPS percentile figures. And this wasn't exactly at a low resolution either, 1176 by 664, which is only marginally below 720p. And this was also with the lowest settings in DirectX 9 mode. But yeah, the game actually ran really quite surprisingly well. The frame times were really consistent, so gameplay seemed pretty smooth. There weren't really any noticeable hitches of stuttering either, and the FPS was generally in the high 20s to the high 30s, although it was usually low to high 30s, with occasional dips into the high 20s when vegetation in the map got quite heavy, so there wasn't really much of an improvement for the overclock to make. The areas of heavy vegetation were now in the low 30s as opposed to the high 20s, and in general, the FPS was now in the low to high 40s and even into the 50s at times. There were the same minor hitches and stuttering which Thoughtbox had, but the frame times were pretty consistent, so the game was still pretty smooth and overall there really wasn't much difference. Now, when looking for games which released in the same year as the 310, 2009 to be exact, I was quite surprised when Minecraft came up. It it doesn't seem that Minecraft has been around for 14 years now at the time I'm making this video, but it has, so yeah, we're testing Minecraft from 2009, although we are using the latest 1.20.1 update, and this is with the resolution set to 900p with the fancy settings, decreased particles and render and sim distance set to 8. And with an average of nearly 47 FPS, and 32.2 and 25.9, 1% and 0.1% lows respectively, the game, like Crisis, actually ran really really well. FPS was always over 30, and it was mostly in the high 30s to around the high 40s, but occasionally would get into the 50 to 60 FPS range in parts. And again, like Crisis, there really weren't any stuttering or hitches or so, and overall the game was quite enjoyable. The overclock showed that you could definitely start to turn the settings up a little bit at this point. We were now always over 40 FPS, with the frame rates generally in the mid 40s to around the mid 50s. The average had even gone up to nearly 54 FPS, 
with nearly 40 FPS, 1% lows, and getting towards 30 FPS for the 0.1%. Fast forward a couple of years, and we get to the original version of Skyrim, which released in 2011. We used the same 1176 by 664 resolution and the lowest settings that I did with Crisis, and surprisingly, this actually ran even worse than Crisis did. It was quite shocking to say the least because Crisis is such a notoriously hard game to run, whereas, at least nowadays anyway, Skyrim you kind of think of as being able to run on pretty much anything. Average frame rates were barely above 30, and the 1% and 0.1% lows of 13.4 and 8.9 FPS really weren't that good either. Outdoors, performance was relatively pretty decent. There were no stuttering or hitches, and FPS was in the high 20s to around the high 30s. It's once you get indoors though that the problems start to appear. FPS was regularly in the high teens and shot up above 30 again in some parts, but every time the FPS drops quite significantly, there was a lot of input lag, and that made combat really, really, really difficult. The overclock really didn't improve things much either. The FPS overall was a little bit higher, but indoors specifically we still got the same severe FPS drops and the same severe input lag which goes along with that. We even had to drop the core clock down a little bit to 690MHz, down from 720 like we had with the previous games. So we're now into 2013 with Bioshock Infinite. I did have to run this at 640x480 for the resolution, at the very low settings, but I was actually quite pleasantly surprised by just how good the game still looks. It's down to the art style of the game, which I think really lends itself well to lower detail graphics. But yeah, the game actually ran really really well. There were no stuttering or hitches, which you can see from the percentile figures on screen. We even averaged almost 50 FPS. The figures were often over that outside of combat, and never dropped below the low to high 40s. I did try to run at a higher resolution initially, 800 by 600, but that had the game running under 30 FPS at times, so I think 640 by 480 with an increase in some of the settings would probably be where you want to stick if you have a 310. With the overclock, the gameplay still felt just as smooth as it did at stock. The frame rate was around 5 to 10 FPS higher than before on average, but the frame times were just as consistent, although the game still felt just as smooth as it was before. We were occasionally getting over 60 FPS now, and more often we're getting into the 50s as well. We're finishing off in 2015 with GT5 now, because the 310 is a DirectX 10.1 only card, so we're kind of at the point now where any newer games just are not going to be able to run. But yeah, GT5 was kind of a complete and utter mess, I think would be a good way to describe it. Resolution wise, I had to use 800 by 600 at the lowest settings, but this was with 50% frame scaling, so effectively 50% render resolution. So this was actually 400 by 300 resolution wise. The problems weren't only just in performance though. Literally just pausing the game caused the graphics driver to crash, and this wasn't just a random occurrence, it was a repeatable problem which happens every single time you pause the game. That aside, we are getting around the high 20s to the high 30s frame rate wise throughout the city, but it could momentarily drop into the low 20s at times with noticeable stuttering whenever that happened. This all doesn't really matter though because, as you probably noticed, there's no benchmark figures on screen, and that's because at the exact same moment whenever you go onto the highway, the game would just freeze and it would never recover. After about 20-30 to 30 seconds like that, it would crash to the desktop and that would be it. I did retry this a couple of times, it crashed at the exact same moment every single time. So GT5 was, without a doubt, a no-go on the 310. This could very well just have been due to uh, incompatibility with a driver. It was the 342.01 driver I used. It may well work with other drivers, but I'm not sure. 
So, in conclusion then, the GeForce 310 is literally just a rebranded, higher clocked GeForce 210. And today, it isn't really much use outside of being a video adapter for a media centre type PC. That's not entirely fair to say though, in my opinion, because gaming wise, as long as you're looking at games from around the time the GeForce 210 slash 310 was released, that being 2009 and before, you're probably still going to have a pretty decent experience at around 720p or just a little bit lower. Later to run games like Minecraft though, you'll be able to run at some relatively high resolutions and decent settings as well, and get away with some pretty decent performance. But well, that's going to be all for today, so if you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate a like and subscribe to the channel, especially if you would like to see more content like this. I'm also relaunching my Patreon page as well, so if you'd like to support me in creating this content, I'll put the link to that down in the description below. But yeah, that's going to be it for now, so hopefully you enjoyed the video, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.